Today, AMC shares tank one day after Reddit traders helped the stock double. Plus, coffee prices are soaring. We explain what's happening to your fancy lattes. And finally, Twitter users in Canada and Australia can hit the undo button on their tweets for a price. I'm Pippa Stevens, and this is CNBC After Hours. Stocks fell across the board, ending the day with slight declines. But that all happened after the market began the day deep in the red. The Dow erased a 265-point loss earlier in the day to finish just more than 20 points lower. And the S&P, well, it's still only 1% away from a fresh record high. It's been hanging out there for about the last two weeks. So we know we talked about AMC already this week, but we need to again. Shares of the popular meme stock were all over the place today. Yesterday, the share price doubled in value. But today, the stock tanked more than 30% when markets opened after the company announced it would sell 11.5 million shares. The price whipped around a bit into the green at one point before ending the day down about 18%. The CNBC digital video team took a deeper look at what was behind today's wild moves. AMC stock went on a roller coaster ride Thursday. Shares of the meme stock plummeted nearly 18% by the end of the day. That ended a massive rally for AMC. Take a look at how the stock has skyrocketed in the past month, a 428% return for investors. The movie theater chain had just announced plans to sell up to 11.5 million new shares of its stock. That would give it fresh cash to buy other movie theaters or to pay down debt. The company had to file these plans with U.S. regulators on Thursday, and within those plans was a pretty stark warning to investors. The company said, we caution you against investing in our Class A common stock unless you're prepared to incur the risk of losing all or a substantial portion of your investment. They were disclosing to investors that this is a highly uh, risk, a high risk investment. They could lose all of their money. Uh, they should not be investing or buying these shares because of the volatility. So they really did try to cover their bases. Later on Thursday, the company said it had completed the new stock offering, raising $587.4 million in additional capital. That sent the stock back into the green, at least temporarily. When you buy the company at a $30 billion market cap, you've already built in the expectation that magical things are going to happen. And if they don't, you're going to be disappointed. So I think the people who win clearly are the people who got net five or $10 billion market caps, not the 30 billion, because at 30 billion, you're asking for the moon and hoping it gets delivered. So why are some retail investors staying in despite the warnings? There is a methodology here. The objective for some of these traders, at least, may not be to make money. It is simply to punish the short sellers and in particular the hedge funds. On Wednesday, short sellers lost $2.8 billion as the stock surged, according to S3. That brings their year-to-date losses to more than $5 billion. But they're not the only ones who could lose money. Institutional investors are warning that retail traders need to be aware of the risks. My biggest concern is what's going on with the individual investor, though, and that they've got to be able to understand kind of when they use leverage, what that really means. Leverage on the way up is a great thing. Leverage on the way down can, can you know, r- rip your arms off. And I think the, the Robin Hoods of the world and the Ask Kevins of the world, we got to do a better job of making sure we educate the individual investor who likes to day trade to make sure they understand what the risks are when the markets start to turn around and how to handle it. Okay, let's get to our sound check. Here's a roundup of the day's biggest action and what the top newsmakers and business leaders had to say on CNBC's airwaves. Content is more important than ever, and there's a finite number of people that create content, all of them vying for, for premium content. Prices are going up across the board. The economics for talent is going up as all these guys bid for premium content to drive eyeballs to their services. So we're going to Venus to find out what's underneath that thick atmosphere and how did it develop so that we understand better Earth and our development and why our atmosphere is as it is to better understand our planet.
I know people are not going to take this uh, kindly, but I, I think old time value investing was lazy and sloppy. I mean, you look at a PE ratio, invest based on that, expect to get rewarded. I think those days are done. I think you still need to think about value, but you need to think about it creatively. It can't be just through what did you make last year? What's your existing business model? You need to be open to the fact that business models are shifting. There's been reports that 50,000 people will be attending the Bitcoin conference in one uh, way, shape or form. And it's already changed the way our city works. Uh, we had FTX, which is a large uh, crypto exchange out of Hong Kong, uh, buy the naming rights uh, to what was formerly the American Airlines Arena, a $200 million deal. And that $200 million deal became a summer jobs program and became a, a strategy to combat gun violence. All right, America's favorite drink is getting more expensive. Coffee prices have risen over 45% in the last year as shipping delays and persistent droughts in Brazil slashed supply. It's just the latest commodity hit by widespread shortages and record prices. Major coffee chains aren't worried just yet, but the same might not be true for smaller coffee shops. Their customers could see prices start to tick higher. Kate Rogers explains. The price of coffee is up just under 25% year to date for a variety of factors. There's an ongoing drought in Brazil that stands to impact coffee crops into 2022 and beyond. Coffee farmers in Colombia are continuing to fight for a living wage and there are also port delays factoring in. According to the NPD group, at U.S. restaurants, the average price of coffee through the year ended April 2021 was $3.23. That's up 7% from a year ago, while specialty coffee like lattes were $4.34. That's up 5% from a year ago. At gourmet outlets, the average price for a regular cup of coffee through April was a bit higher at $3.77, up 8% from a year ago, but specialty coffee were $4.85 a cup, up 3% from a year ago. The good news is that the current rise in coffee futures shouldn't be hitting big chains like Dunkin' or Starbucks, at least just yet. In a statement, Dunkin', which is fully franchised, said, while local pricing is set by independent franchisees, we've been able to successfully manage costs to continue to deliver a great cup of coffee at a great value. We don't anticipate any noticeable impact to price anytime soon. And Starbucks said, our coffee purchasing contracts are put in place well in advance, reducing volatility for everyone and pay premiums that support farmer livelihoods above commodity market price. As far as retail pricing, we planned ahead as well and expect to remain on par with industry practices and below food away from home inflation, which is 3.9%. According to the National Federation of Independent Business, the number of small businesses that are currently raising prices across the board, which would of course include small coffee shops, is at a rate not seen since 1981. So costs are going up across the board. One of the biggest factors, aside from just raw materials costs, commodities costs, etc., is labor. A lot of small businesses are looking for workers right now. 44% of small businesses have roles that they can't fill. So higher labor costs to attract and retain workers, of course, are also factoring in as prices rise across the board. Okay, time for today's numbers round. First up, 349. Twitter just dropped its first subscription service called Twitter Blue. In Canada, it costs $3.49 Canadian dollars per month. And in Australia, it costs $4.49 in Australian dollars per month. Here in the US, well, it's not here yet. Twitter hasn't said when the new service will be available in the US. Twitter Blue marks the first attempt from the social media company to create a subscription-based business model. This is designed for so-called power users. Perhaps most importantly, subscribers get the ability to preview and undo tweets. They also get other features like a reader mode and customized themes. Next, 15. United Airlines is going supersonic. The airline is buying 15 planes from Boom Supersonic. That's a Denver-based company that wants to bring a supersonic flight back to the skies. It hasn't built or certified its supersonic planes yet, but the company plans to start flying in 2029. Its supersonic jet, called the Overture, would be able to fly at 1.7 times the speed of sound. That would cut a seven-hour flight from New York to London to about three and a half hours. Commercial air travel hasn't seen faster than sound flights since 2003, when the supersonic Concorde jet retired from service. 
And finally, 385,000. It's Thursday, so that means we saw data on weekly initial jobless claims. That's how many people filed for unemployment benefits for the first time. Initial jobless claims fell below 400,000 for the first time since the COVID-19 pandemic began, hitting 385,000 last week, or about 20,000 fewer than the prior week. The U.S. labor market has bounced back as more and more people get vaccinated, and more workers are also returning to jobs just before it boosted unemployment benefits expire in September. The new jobless claims data comes one day before an important Jobs Friday, when we get a deeper look at the unemployment rate and how many jobs the economy has added or lost. Economists expect a big number tomorrow, which could have major implications for the market. Stay on top of the latest Jobs Friday news by going to CNBC.com and downloading the CNBC app. That's it for After Hours. We'll be back here in our home office every Tuesday and Thursday, so be sure to catch us then.